Good to see you all. Nice to be with you. I'm delighted to sit up here uh, among the leaders of four of our important seminaries, two of them Anglican, two of them Evangelical. And I want to ask if we could just start far to my left, John, with you, and if you would introduce yourself first to us. We'll introduce our seminaries a little bit later on, please. I'm John Abbott. I'm the Dean and Provost of the Reformed Episcopal Seminary, which is in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. I represent that one institution, but there are other seminaries in the Reformed Episcopal Church. We have the Dean of Cranmer House, which is in Houston here as well at this conference. And we have uh, a number of students at our seminaries here. If you're a student at one of the RE seminaries, would you stand up? Thank you. Thank you, John. Sam, please. My name is Sam Schutz, and I'm uh, the uh, associate to the provost for Anglican Studies at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm a happy graduate of Gordon-Conwell and of Trinity Seminary. How many Anglicans do you estimate uh, you have at Gordon? Perhaps we'll get into this discussion as we move along. Uh, we have an increasing number of Anglicans at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. We have a very small Anglican Studies program. Uh, students, when they come to Gordon-Conwell, are generally not Anglicans. They become aware of the Anglican way, increasingly attracted to the Anglican way, and uh, so we provide an educational opportunity for them to move into the Anglican Church, and that's basically our ministry at the uh, Master of Divinity level, and then we offer a Doctor of Ministry program. A lot of us uh, coming out of uh, a commitment to Christ uh, early, perhaps in our 20s, going to Reformed, going to Gordon, found ourselves on the Canterbury Trail. I'm one of those people, ended up in the Anglican Communion. Justin. Yeah, I'm Justin Terry. I'm the Dean and President of Trinity School for Ministry. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> um, as you can tell from the funny accent, I didn't grow up around here. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, prior to that, I was a rector of a church in West London, and uh, I, too, I, I grew up Baptist, basically, and became a, a member of the Evangelical Church of England while I was at Oxford, and um, very thrilled to be here. We've got lots of Trinity uh, students here and alumni. I don't know if they want to stand or raise a hand so we can just celebrate that. There's a huge number of folks, and we <laughs> celebrate the work. Um, Trinity was founded by a, a missionary church planter, and these are already uh, the uh, sort of DNA of Trinity. So we're thrilled to be here. Thank you, Justin. Robert. I'm Robert Monday, and I'm the Dean and President at Neshota House Seminary. <laughs> Can I ask the Neshota House people to stand, <laughs> if you would? Yay. Yeah. I'm one of those Canterbury trailers that Jeff talked about that found my way into Anglicanism and delight in the wonderful riches of this tradition. Well, welcome to you all. Um, we're going to get into a couple of uh, pokey questions that uh, Ed Stetzer raised for us yesterday. But before we do that, if, if you would give us just a quick overview, we've done that perhaps a little bit, but a quick overview of your seminary and of your connection into serving the Anglican church planting movement. John. All right, well, there is actually a piece of paper on the tables. It's gray in color that pretty much describes what the RE uh, Seminary stands for. Uh, I, the second part of your question, no, that's the, uh, another program, it's the, the gray one. And, and uh, uh, how you're connected in supporting Anglican church planting. Well, uh, one of the things that we believe very strongly, I, I had no problem with anything that Ed Stetzer said yesterday. As a matter of fact, he answered one or two questions for me. But the, uh, the concern is not so much on our end with whether or not we need to send lay leaders out to plant churches, but what happens to a church that, when they need a pastor? It can take years to build a church. It can be torn down in weeks. So our concern is to support the work of church planting I have been personally involved in, uh, in one way or another, in the planting or resuscitation 
of over 30 congregations. Some of those are not still with us, which is why the, my previous comment is, uh, is driven. Great. I, I think we'll find that e each of the seminaries often feature on the teaching faculty theologian pastors who've had substantive parish experience like you have. Every member of our faculty is currently or has been in the pastoral ministry. Uh, I am still the rector of a parish, 28 years in the same location. Right. Sam. Approximately four years ago, Gordon Conwell invited administrators from Trinity School for Ministry and Neshota House to come to our campus to give us guidance in the development of an Anglican studies program. And we're very grateful uh, to them for coming and doing so, meeting then with Dean Barry Corey. And the current design of our uh, offerings uh, then are a result of, uh, of that excellent preparatory work. Um, our involvement in church planting, uh, I'm professor of evangelism and church planting at Gordon-Conwell Seminary and uh, am uh, obviously Anglican um, and was involved in the planting of five churches uh, as the pastor, um, but over 25 years ago for the Evangelical Covenant Church. And so I picked up from one of my former mentors at Fuller Theological uh, Seminary, the importance of a resident faculty member who's acting as professor of record to bring in current church planters to teach church planting. And so we began uh, about three years ago uh, a uh, Master of Divinity course in church planting taught by uh, Father Tom Herrick uh, Bishop Doc Loomis, uh, Bishop Bill Murdoch. We have other invited guests who are also coming into that program. Uh, Dr. Mark Reynolds from Redeemer Presbyterian Church. And that meets uh, in an intensive four-day uh, session for lectures the end of May. And then students have the remainder of time to fulfill the only requirement for that class, which is to prepare a proposal for planning a church in a community of their choice, and we prepare them so that they can do that uh, very well. And so we're, uh, we're very grateful that that class has now become the most popular class. I can say this because I don't teach the class. I'm only a professor of record. Has become the most popular class on the Gordon-Conwell campus with students who come primarily to learn Greek, Hebrew, church history, systematic theology, but uh, they have now a, uh, uh, an uh, increasing interest in church planting. Across denominational lines, the majority of students that we have coming into that class are Anglicans, and many who are not Anglicans are now beginning to explore the Anglican way. Great, great, thank you. Justin. Well, Trinity mm -hmm. School for Ministry is an evangelical seminary in the Anglican tradition. It was uh, began in the 1970s as a way of having a clearly uh, gospel-centered uh, seminary for the Episcopal Church and founded really as a reaction against some of the liberalism of other seminaries. So we um, very much see ourselves as uh, not the kind of seminary that people are worried about. We often hear people <laughs> criticizing seminaries. We think we're not that kind of a seminary. Uh, and there are plenty of seminaries out there that do, I think, um, take away confidence in the gospel or um, that confidence that the Bible is the word of God. Uh, we're not here to support that kind of work. We think that really does, uh, does mischief. Uh, so we are very much an evangelical seminary in the Anglican tradition. Uh, in terms of how we can support this movement, um, we've been listening to a number of you and we wanna keep getting feedback from you, but what we're currently offering, you can pay, take basically just in time uh, training. Uh, there are individual classes, like as you'll see on the tables in front of you, we're doing a, a one week class in June term that John McDonald uh, has been organizing. I don't know if John's there, our professor of mission and evangelism. Um, you see this, a number of the people who are experts in the field uh, agree to come and spend a week with us. You can take it as a week uh, intensive and there's a conference at the end of it. So there are individual classes. You can take a Master of Arts in Mission, uh, church planting focus uh, by intensives and online classes. Or if you want to go to the MDiv level, you can trade all those things in towards the MDiv. We require two, uh, two residential uh, semesters 
We do think something important happens by being with those who are prepared for this kind of level of leadership. Uh, and that can again be focused on church planting. And there's a demin, with a, uh, you can focus it anywhere you like, but there's a particular focus now also on church planting. So we really are seeking to hear um, what is needed in the field. I myself did some church planting. I've only planted the one church. I, um, but that was, um, I was more of a, if you like, the mother church out of which a church was planted in inner city London. About nine out of the 11 uh, full-time faculty at Trinity have been involved with church planting and uh, the renewal of churches. So again, we again want to you know, applaud what's going on at this conference. We're thrilled to be a part of it and uh, really are praying that God will bless uh, the work that's being done. Robert. Well, I want to echo a part of what Justin just said. I, I think we're at the crisis we are in Anglicanism because of several generations of bad theological education uh, that robbed the church of its message and undermined its mission. But if we're in this room this morning, it's because at some point we got hold of sound teaching, or sound teaching got hold of us. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that should have happened in seminary, and there's no reason why it can't happen in seminary. Imagine if you can go away and get the kind of, uh, you know, learn to handle the Word of God the way uh, we've had in our morning Bible studies, uh, learn the kind of church planning strategies that Ed Stetzer talks about. At Neshota House, we're working with William Beasley and his greenhouse strategy for using lay of catechists, lay evangelists to plant congregations because we believe that it's going to take a movement that empowers the laity if we're actually going to achieve a thousand new congregations in five years' time. So we train lay catechists, lay evangelists through our distance learning program, but we also train the trainers, train the priests who know how to go out and mobilize the laity to be lay catechists, lay evangelists, because that's, that's essentially what the church is called to do. One of the uh, things that got my attention in Ed's talk yesterday was a quote, I'm, I'm on the board of Trinity and so uh, have worked with seminaries for some years and when people say things like this, it does get your attention. You cannot create a church planting movement fostered by the seminaries. And that has, um, that's a stiff sentence that I'm sure made a number of ears perk up around uh, the people sitting here. Uh, on this platform today, uh, a lot of us who have thought deeply about these have concluded that it, that may be true, but it is also true that you really can't do it without the seminaries. And so here we are, we're um, four seminaries, more could be up here with us, and yet uh, real evidence of flexibility on the part of these institutions, um, listening ears to what is going on out at the field, what God is raising up and what the demands are in opening up new tracks of leadership preparation and development, a cooperative effort among leaders. You, you see hints of that uh, in just the comments that have already been made. Let me ask, uh, again, a cycle of questions about Ed's comment in view of the uh, of the overwhelming challenge uh, of raising up so many leaders in such a period of time and of the call that we have heard again and again from the new diocese, the new province, the new diocese, uh, the new movements to open up creative, perhaps non-residential opportunities for leadership preparation and training as well. What have been some of the initiatives that have been most important to you all? We've mentioned a few of these, but I'd like to give you one more shot at it, please. Uh, what have been some of the initiatives that you've developed or worked with that are most promising and important uh, in your seminaries? Well, in our case, I think there are several, although we are very small. The first is, you see on the tables, a pamphlet about a licentiate and diaconal ministry which is an at-a-distance program with a one-day, Ember Day uh, residency where, you where the students come in. And these are basically people who are being trained to either begin a church plant or to support local ministry. The second thing is <laughs> that those going out into church planting ministries or resuscitation ministries are often entering into a situation where their financial resources are limited. Ed said yesterday that we <coughs> can't do church planting at this magnitude with full-time funded uh, church planters. We also can't do it with students who are carrying a lot of debt. So one of the things that we have instituted is a program wherein all of our full-time MDiv students have full tuition scholarships. We don't believe 
that our students should leave the seminary into the ministry carrying debt for an education to serve Christ's kingdom. So the seminary is funded. Amen. So the seminary is actually funded by those who support the work of an ordained uh, ministry. The third element is, as I understand it, the work of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Our job is to equip the equippers. And so even though we only want to, our, our goal is to receive 12 students, to graduate 12 students, to send them out. Jesus kind of gave us a model. <laughs> Three years was another model for uh, pastoral training that we use. But the idea is that those individuals can influence a great many more beyond that. The first church plant was not an accident in God's mind, but it certainly was an accident in the church's mind because it happened because the Christians in Jerusalem were persecuted. Shortly thereafter, we hear a church started in Antioch. The church in Jerusalem didn't say, good. They said, send Paul and Barnabas to check it out and make sure they got it right. So while lay ministry is a part of this, a highly educated, qualified, ordained ministry to support an Anglican notion of word and sacrament, discipleship and training is absolutely necessary. If it isn't there, we will fall victim to the Gnosticism yeah. of the 21st century. And it really has been a pleasure for me to get to know Robert and Justin and Sam and to begin to work cooperatively, cooperatively with them. Uh, none of us can address this issue by, on our own. Thank you, Every, everybody here needs the support of the other institutions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sam. First of all, I want to say we're very envious of reformed that we cannot offer full scholarships to all of our students. <laughs> We do have a partnership a program with local churches, students who come to us in helping to provide uh, financial support and we offer generous scholarships. But more to the point of the question, uh, at uh, Gordon-Conwell, we're going through a curriculum review right now in recognition of the need to move forward in uh, an education that is increasingly praxis, 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 praxis. Let me say very quickly, in all of our institutions, we have inherited a German higher education model, which is where students come, sit at our feet, the professor lectures, the students take notes, and we're all working our way out of that. Mm -hmm. But we are working our way out of that. Mm -hmm. So the strength, I believe, of theological seminaries is the way in which a student can come for an, a very brief period of time and get an excellent education in a concentrated way. And that, again, is the German model. But we are moving increasingly into combining uh, coursework with praxis work. I, I already said our MDiv church planting class requirement is to develop a proposal for planting a church. In our new Doctor of Ministry program, uh, the requirements of the program are for the student who enters to develop around their own ministry a project, year one in church planting, introductory level, <clears throat> year two around their own ministry, a uh, project in church planting, intermediate level, year three around their own ministry, a project in church planting, advanced level, and we have a number of different concentrations in our Doctor of Ministry at Gordon-Conwell. This is a new uh, uh, offering at the seminary, and we're hopeful that, and I'm expectant, that what has happened in the other uh, offerings will happen in church planting, and that is, by God's grace, we'll be able to produce uh, with the instructors uh, 
and the supervisors who are working with the students, a new literature for church planting for the 21st century, and we need a new model for church planting, which is both more biblical, less materialistic, and a far more prayerful spiritual model of uh, church uh, planting. We're also working with um, Bishop Bill Murdoch in, in his uh, model of uh, ministry houses, and the students are moving from ministry houses developing the Anglican Way community into their larger communities in sharing the gospel. So there are a number of innovative things that we're doing and that the other seminaries are, are doing. And I just want to second your uh, appeal that we work together. I was in conversation uh, this morning with our provost, Frank James, for whom, of course, I work. And he asked me uh, to return the favor of uh, you all who helped us start our program four years ago. And he wishes me to extend an invitation on his behalf for a one-day summit, Anglican Education Preparation Summit. He himself is Anglican. Uh, and to extend this invitation, deans uh, <clears throat> and or presidents of Trinity, Neshota, Reformed, Archbishop Duncan, Father David Roseberry, for the purpose of thinking creatively in how we can work together to serve the educational needs of the Anglican Church in North America to prepare leaders for the church planting movement, which we are uh, about. Of course, beginning with the planting of a thousand churches in the next five years. We need synergy as we give away our ideas to one another and bless one another for the future. All right. Thank you, Sam. Justin. Well, I, I was, uh, <clears throat> want to very much endorse what's being said here. I think we share some of the uh, common concerns. I mean, one of the things that uh, is striking, I think, for places like Trinity and others, that from, from our foundation, we've been training lay leaders as well as ordained leaders. About a third of Trinity's graduates are in lay ministry. Uh, and we very much support this movement to have people involved in planting churches and being parts of teams of church planters before they get ordained. Um, what we want to also be doing, though, is encourage them to go on with the training. I hear the desire to get out there and get going, and I, I'm right with it. <laughs> but what we don't want to do is allow this desire to get out there and do the work of the gospel uh, as a way of inadvertently lowering the standard of the education of those who are leading Amen. the mission. And I think it's not a matter of um, cutting it down as spreading it out. Mm -hmm. don't, don't feel you've got to sort of get out there, just take three or four courses and then get out and get going. Don't see that as the end. That may be a way of getting started. Mm -hmm. But to say, look, we want to keep on going step by step to Amen. build up the standards. We want the clergy of the Anglican Communion to be the best equipped, yes. the best trained. I come from a country where secularism has got a grip, partly because the clergy, frankly, were not so well trained. And I tell you, it's very difficult ministering in a country that's become deeply secular. You go from a place where Christianity, as it is here, is seen as still a serious option for life transformation to a situation where Christianity is seen as the problem. It's a very different world. Yeah. People who cross the street to avoid you because you're wearing a collar. People who see you as part of some strange bygone era, they kind of pat you on the head and hope you're going to grow up one day. <laughs> you know. So I'm just, I want to also say that I'm absolutely with the enthusiasm, the drive, the get going. I'm, I'm thrilled by all these things. But I'm saying in the midst of all that, let's not inadvertently lower the standard. Get people out there, get them training, get them leading, uh, get them right in the thick of this church planting movement. But bring them on stage by stage so they get the qualifications, they get maybe their Master of Arts in Mission. We're saying we, we can do that now. Uh, classic lay training. You don't have to relocate to Ambridge. Uh, you can do that online and in, in intensive format and get the master's level training. That's something only recently available. I know it's a, something similar is available at Neshoda and I'm sure elsewhere too. So we really are hearing the desire to seriously equip lay leaders without requiring the classic three-year residential formation. We're still great fans of that. Um, 
But what we want to be able to do is say, you can take that and then as you go on with the training, as you get on involved in church planting and developing church life, to carry on, take more classes, yes. get to the MDiv level, go on, you can do an STM, Amen. you can do a DMIN. Amen. Uh, and all these things, so we really end up with active people who are seeing the value of what we do. I mean, every class we teach at Trinity, it isn't just the theory, it's the practice. Mm -hmm. we, these things work together. It's not an either or. Uh, when I teach systematic theology, no lecture ends without us talking about the implications for ministry. Why does all this stuff matter? That's why I'm excited about theological education. Uh, I know how crucial it is that our minds and our hearts are integrated. And we've got a deep confidence that the gospel is true. It is the power of God for salvation. And there is no force of, heaven, or of hell or anything that's going to bring the thing down. Because it is true, the light of the gospel will overcome the darkness. And so we are excited about that, but we want to applaud what's going on and say, don't just, um, in the urgency, don't compress it and stop it short. Get people going where they are, but make sure in the end we've got the best qualified, best trained of clergy so that we are ready for the onslaught of secularism and that the gospel-centered Anglican churches thrive as beacons of light and peace and hope. And may the Lord's mercy come and may there be a revival in this land and in Western Europe so that the gospel is seen for what it is. It's the hope of the nations. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jeff. Robert. Well, of course, I was really struck by Ed's comment yesterday. Uh, hit more between the eyes, you might say. <laughs> but Ed obviously believes that, that seminaries have a critical role to play in church planning because he spends a good portion of his time teaching in seminaries. <laughs> right. <laughs> Praise God. The... Uh, the most critical dynamic in any movement is the training of its leadership. Absolutely. And uh, as you, know, you look at the model that Jesus gave, he, he, while we only have a portion of what he taught the disciples in the Gospels, he spent three years very deliberately, purposely teaching his disciples. Uh, the Apostle Paul, after the Damascus Road experience, goes away for three years before he begins his apostolic ministry. Right. Uh, there is a place in which we have to be mm -hmm. formed, uh, not haphazardly, but intentionally formed for the ministries to which God's calling us. And that's what seminaries, uh, when they provide a good, biblical, godly education, uh, are about. That's why we've developed a distance learning program, a master's degree through distance learning, so that we can teach people who can't relocate for three years, uh, but who are in some type of godly, mentored ministry while they're doing that program. And so I think all of us really are working to make uh, the education that we offer more accessible. Uh, because we really see the training of leadership, the discipling of the leaders, as being an extension of the Great Commission. Amen. Amen. There is um, per perhaps time for one more round of questions. Uh, if the task of preparing leaders uh, features at least three things, one would be to teach uh, the Bible and the theology of the Christian faith, uh, to teach and form people in that. The second would be the skills of ministry that are necessary in a church plant or in a parish leadership. The third would be to form the character and the spirituality of our leaders. So those three things, to teach theology and, and the Bible, to teach the skills of ministry, to form the character and spirituality of our, um, of our rising leaders, uh, do you feel comfortable about those as a set of priorities? Would you add to it or uh, take from it? Um, would you, uh, which of those do you find most critical and perhaps most challenging in the emerging effort at planting a thousand churches in five years? John. What time are we breaking? <laughs> <laughs> We're breaking in five minutes. <laughs> Well, uh, <clears throat> first of all, one of the critical issues that faces the church today is a proper hermeneutical approach to Scripture. Mm -hmm. Understanding the Bible in context, what God intended when he caused it to be given, what God intended when he caused it to re be recorded, what God intended for us to receive and distribute today. There's all too many people who twist the scriptures to make them say what their preconceived <laughs> notions are. Part of our job is to equip individuals to rightly understand the scripture. 
Secondly, with respect to Anglican theology and formation, an education that is rooted in the historic liturgy and the articles of religion and the creeds as espoused by the Anglican Church in, the Nor in North America. The element then is proclamation. God's communication of the gospel, for some strange reason, is that he chose to use the foolishness of preaching. Well, one of the, the things that we bring to the table is that our students probably get more practical preaching experience than any other institution in the country. Uh, I would dare say our students will preach before faculty and classmates maybe up to 30 or 40 times yeah. during their education. And they will be critiqued and evaluated. They go out of the seminary with a huge portfolio of preparation. And then the third element of mentorship is that they are required to be involved with a local pastoral mentor. If uh, a bishop from another jurisdiction sends a student to us, that student is responsible to his bishop, and the bishop must uh, either release him to work someplace else as an intern or participate in his education as his chaplain or, uh, or a point one. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our leader has told me, speak briefly, <laughs> and so I will do so. In the, the uh, three um, areas that you mentioned, you just described the design of the Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary MDiv curriculum, so, uh, and I think probably for all of our schools. And so I fully support it because I'm a professor at Gordon Conwell and committed to that. Um, I believe that we um, need to increasingly practice in the classroom what the students will then be practicing in their own church and community. And we're doing that more and more at Gordon-Conwell, no matter what is being taught. And President Terry has mentioned that he does that in his courses. I suspect that's true across the board. Let, let me just say before I pass the baton, I thought that the comment that was made about seminaries never being able to produce enough church planters was true insofar as it goes. but. If the role of the seminary is to be a catalyst, I think that we then view the seminary in its necessary and integral role, and we can act as catalysts for the Anglican Church in North America, as I believe no other entity within the church can, and uh, provide substance and quality in the process Great. of doing so. Well, I'd want to also endorse those three areas. I think there are things we want all our graduates to know about the Bible, the history of the church, uh, theology, all the practical skills and of the pastoral um, theology. Also, in terms of skills, we want to send out preachers, teachers, evangelists, pastors, uh, all these very practical and vital and energizing skills. I think the third one in the end is character formation. If you've got to prioritize any one of them, I'd put my priority there. In the end, people, especially in this more postmodern generation, want to see authenticity in its Christian leadership. Yes. That's what our congregations need to see, that the knowledge and the skills shape characters, godly men and women, who draw people to Jesus Christ. Uh, and I would say that would be my priority, and I think it is probably for Trinity. Yeah. You know, Jeff, I think you hit the nail right on the head with your list. I mean, all faithful ministry, all successful ministry has to be grounded in the Word of God. Amen. But then it also consists of training leaders who know what it means to abide in Christ and that spiritual formation that happens as we prepare for leadership in the church. We believe that, that at Neshota House that that happens best in community, and that's why even our, our distance learning program has a residential component to it. But as you, uh, you know, foundation, as you're being formed as a priest, 
Um, John Piper said something that, uh, that illuminated me as I was preparing a, an Ash Wednesday uh, retreat that we gave at Neshota House. He says in John chapter 15 that when Jesus talks about abiding in Christ and being fruitful, being you know, the vine making us fruitful, uh, that it's not just talking about the fruit of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians, love, joy, peace, patience, and so on, but talking about conversions, that the aim of our abiding in Christ and having his word abide in us is that others will come to know Christ and have their lives transformed by the gospel that we proclaim. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe it's all of these things, but the pastoral skills that we teach have to be uh, aimed at reflecting our ministry in a way that brings others to know Christ. Amen. Well, I, I hope that gives you a picture of, of four seminaries, more in this family of seminaries that are serving this movement, of institutions that are on their tiptoe, that are listening carefully both to you and yes. to the Lord in the middle of this rising opportunity, and that are creatively engaged in resourcing uh, the work that we're doing on the field and the, the, the work of raising up this next generation of church planters. I was particularly interested that uh, there was a sensitivity to, uh, to uh, providing full scholarships. I know in at least a couple of our institutions, I, uh, to, that comes because donors give generously with that in mind. And I'm waiting for the seminary that's ready to help pay off debt of graduates who are already out there. <laughs> We're looking for that one. Would you give these men a round of applause? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.